the dread familiar. On this, the first episode of the podcast, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Joel. I'm not an author or a professional voice actor. I am a longtime musician and recording engineer. I am also, more importantly, a huge fan of all things horror. I especially love stories that drive a deep, slow dread that may linger long after the tale has ended. As life goes on, that feeling has become a comfort to me against the stresses of everyday living. And I hope you feel the same way. In order to facilitate a personal and close fear, I'd like to invite you, listener, to be involved in the future of this podcast. My primary goal is to tell stories written by you, as well as some well-loved and well-tread classics. Perhaps you're not a writer, but have a talent for reading. I'd like to hear from you too. If you happen to have the rare gift of both writing and performing the reading of your own work, that's even better. I'm also open to true personal accounts, art, thought pieces, etc. I'd like to feature the things that you, listener, want to hear. So please submit your stories, voice auditions, and anything else you think might be worthwhile to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Tonight I'll be bringing you two stories, the first of which is written by Benjamin Gardner. Ben is a writer and artist living in the Midwestern United States. His recent publications include stories in the first issue of Mysterium Tremendum and Night Terrors Volume 4. Gardner is a professor of art and design at Drake University. And if you want to check out more of his works, his website is www.benjaminagardner.com. Gardner is spelled G-A-R-D-N-E-R. Benjaminagardner.com. So without further ado, Demeter by Benjamin Gardner. Sometimes the rocks and the trees were the only things that assured me I was alive. It felt like we were an army of disembodied souls floating away from home. It was necessary for us to be quiet as we followed just below the ridge of the mountains and occasionally dipping down below the tree line when the terrain got too difficult at higher altitudes. Svetla's dark brown shirt with red embroidery was an anchor to make sure I was not falling too far behind the rest of the group. Because we weren't talking, I'd started seeing things. My brain was inventing forms and mysteries in my surroundings and I felt disoriented. I'd had three days of these illusions and needed to focus on the feelings of my feet hitting the well-worn path. I needed to remember that I was marching with others in search of Demeter. When we'd stopped on the fourth day, Liuda insisted that we would walk another three days in peace, and if we had peace in our hearts, we would find Demeter. No one objected, but I could feel the fabric of our morale fraying. Liuda was a good leader and excellent on the mountain trails, but seven days of silence would be difficult for anyone. Talking and singing as we hiked made the time pass by through the cold wind and rain. Without our voices, we only heard the wind in the trees and the occasional cry of a hawk searching for food. I used to like those sounds back home, especially in the woods wandering around with Dano and Svetla. Now it just sounded like empty songs coming off the mountain's peaks reminding me of how far away I was. When we stopped, I found a place to sit and eat my dried fruit, and Daniel and Svetla followed me along trail. This, the fourth day of our journey, had been difficult, and Leota said that we should walk until dark to make sure we journeyed as far as we could. I couldn't ever sit with my back to the forest below us, I felt like there was something there, something lurking between the trunks of the trees and the absences of light. Little shimmering worms that stretched in the darkness and disappeared whenever I focused on them. I did not mention it to my friends. We ate in silence, looking at one another and communicating through crude hand signals as much as possible. Liuda's idea of peace was silence. We had been prepared for this part of our journey because she'd told us that we would have to walk in peace. We met Liuda in the center of Ada, near the meeting place. Liuda wasn't from Ada, 
but had lived there longer than any of the other townspeople, so when she started having visions of Demeter, people listened. Liuta told all of us about the land of Demeter and how food and soil would be plentiful there. She talked of Demeter being safe from our enemies, protected by the mountains. She would build a temple, she said, to the gods that had told her about this journey and this path to save our lives. Demeter would be our new home once we arrived there. The others would come as soon as we built houses. There were some from town that would not come, and many were skeptical whether Demeter existed at all. It wasn't on our maps, and the elders did not know of its existence. The path in the mountains was dangerous, they said, and the whole caravan would likely be eaten by the wolves before we'd ever reach the new land. Liuta was confident, though, that we'd be protected as long as we walked in peace. We all had amulets and knives. We had not been bothered so far on our journey, aside from my own apparitions dancing between the trees. I believed in Liuta. She was clearly able to communicate to something that I could not comprehend. My father and uncle think that she is mistaking the signs. Demeter is not a place, they said, but rather a god in and of itself. Though I miss my home, there is nothing there for me or my friends. There is not enough food, and the land is barren. I believed in Liuta because I had nothing else to believe in. Branches cracked and I peered into the woods to see if anything could be seen. Daniel and Svetla both stood, placing their food on the ground and placing their hands on the amulets Liuta had given us. The space between the trees was pure darkness, but I swore that I could see lines of light, flashes of something that looked like it was projected in the space. The lights blinked in and out which made them hard to focus on. We could see nothing corporeal and didn't know what made the noise of cracking branches. Some weight fell on my shoulder and I jumped, turning quickly towards the pressure and feeling of someone else's touch. It was Liuta. She stood with her hand on my shoulder and looked into the woods, smiling. I heard it too. It is not of this earth and it will not hurt us, she said. Svetla and Dano both smiled with her, looking at the flickering images moving in the forest. They became more prominent after Liuta acknowledged them. I felt like Svetla and Daniel could see them as well. Liuta did not offer me comfort though, as I was having a hard time adjusting to not speaking of my anxieties and troubles. I know this is difficult. Liuta stepped closer and raised my chin with her fingers. We are here and we are okay. We have what we need and there are gifts all around. We will find Demeter soon. Liuta looked slightly away from me, just above my head, as if someone else was speaking to her. If they were, she did not make any mention of it. I felt something else beside me hovering somewhere over my shoulder. Liuta smiled before she looked back at me and walked away. I only felt dread with the unwanted presences of the unseen interlocutor and the flickering lights in the woods. I tried to smile and gave her the sign that she taught us before we started on our journey. I understand what you are feeling, she said, stopping a few steps away from me. You don't know what is real. You don't know if you are real. This is all a part of the journey, a part of the path. When you no longer feel like yourself, when you have to define what is real, you know you are on the way to transcendence. Conversation with the gods means a death of ego. Otherwise, the boundaries of identity will never allow transference. Others standing close to Liuta on the trail were bobbing their heads in agreement, as if I was the only one who had not yet transferred. Svetla touched my arm in comfort to let me know that I was not alone. I nodded and signed thank you by bowing, though it gave me no solace. The mountain flattened into a field with grass and soil. We set up camp that night in the middle of the field away from the tree line. All night though, I saw the transparent forms and lights in the forest. I could hear the voices telling me that I did not belong here. The voices sounded like my grandmother and my parents, a chorus of family members that made my heart ache and miss my home. 
I wanted desperately to know what they were, to see them as beings that I could understand and name. If I looked too long toward the trees, though, the lights would form into terrible shapes. Giant humanoid shapes that grasped the trunks of the trees and reached through the forest, walking straight towards our camp. I couldn't sleep. I held my amulet and didn't dare look into the woods for more than a few minutes. Svetla woke in the middle of the night as I sat, looking for spots of grassland down below us, trying to ignore the voices from the forest. I thought she was awake, but she may have been sleepwalking. She broke her silence and spoke to me. It was difficult to focus on what she was saying because of the voices from the figures of light in the woods. It was a shock, too, because we hadn't spoken in so long. She looked to be in a trance, her eyes focused on something distant, though I knew her words were directed at me. Demeter is not a place. She closed her eyes and laid her head on my lap. I moved her over to her sleeping bag and stayed by her the rest of the night, as it gave me something to focus on, sitting watching over her as she slept. I met the morning without any sleep, and tired of looking at rock features of the mountains, which had begun to morph into their own monstrous shapes. Liuta sang a song to wake everyone up and inspire us for the journey ahead. One person, a young man by the name of Nikol, did not get up with Liuta's voice, and it was understood that he had died in the night, silently. Liuta lifted his name up to her gods and said that Nikol had returned to them, in the earth and on the air, and his spirit would help guide us to Demeter. There were no marks on the boy's body, but he was ghostly pale and drained of life. Liuta signed for two others to bury him before we made our journey. They piled up rocks on his body until it was covered, a blanket of stone barely noticeable in the mountain landscape. Liuta gathered us all up for a short prayer for Nico and asked for guidance to Demeter. She had the look again that she was listening to someone or something just above us. She looked and listened, even though none of us could hear anything. She nodded vigorously and smiled. We must again walk in peace, but I have been told good news, Liuta said. Everyone shifted and shoulders lightened at the idea of good news. We will reach Demeter tonight if we walk in peace. Relief swept through the crowd, and I'll admit that I was relieved. Without sleep, I was unsure how long I would be able to continue hiking through the mountains. There was a lightness in everyone's step as we continued through the mountain field, close to the tree line, and an audible sigh of relief when the sun peeked over the mountains. I could smell spring water nearby and kept a lookout for boulders or other indicators of water from the ground. I caught a glimpse of a crude pyramid made of wood. I walked quickly ahead of Daniel and Svetla so that I wouldn't get left behind and found the fresh water coming from the ground and filled my canteen. Others had seen me and joined in collection of the fresh water. We ate hard crackers as we walked. I thought about what we would have eaten at home around a fire, porridge perhaps with fresh herbs. I found my mouth salivating at the idea of herbs as I chewed on crackers and swallowed them. The hard crackers fought off the hunger but offered little in pleasure. In the afternoon I saw the path slope downward and observed more plants and trees scattered through the landscape. I had somehow fallen to the last of the line. Trailing, Daniel and Svetla were far ahead of me and I could barely make out Liuta as she led us, weaving between larger rocks and turns in the trail. The ridge of the mountains eased down towards the ground we walked on and I thought I saw Liuta turning in. The further down we got, the denser the forest became, tall pines and spruce trees surrounding us and covering the ground in bronze needles. Streaks of light flickered in the woods as I jogged to catch up, the water in my canteen sloshing around. I felt bulky and frantic as I tried to keep up with the group and stay away from whatever lived between the trees. I caught brief glimpses of Svetla's red embroidery, but she kept disappearing behind trees, I didn't dare yell to break my silence. Little tendrils of light stretched out from the trees and slowed me down. Snakes of light and fluorescence wrapped around the trees and stretched out to grab me. 
Dano and Svetla seemed to be running ahead with everyone else. I could see a giant blast of sunlight shining through the trees where Liuta stood with others gathering around her. I could feel the joy on their faces and I could only imagine what they gazed upon. It must have been Demeter. But whatever they were looking at was obscured from my view. I struggled to walk. I was far away from the group and ran through the woods, but some invisible force pulled me towards the trees. Svetla looked back and saw me struggling and pulled on Daniel's sleeve. They ran back towards me to help. I was crawling through the woods. I wanted so badly to see the splendor and vision of Demeter. Svetla and Daniel pulled me up and the beings in the forest let go. I could move freely. I could hear the calls from the woods mixed with the joy from Liuta and the others looking upon Demeter. We ran towards the break in the trees where all of the light was coming from. I could hear the birds, a cacophony of insects, and the low voices from the woods beckoning me to come back. The noises in the trees around crowded out the songs of joy coming from where Liuta and the others stood. Insects, birds, and wolves all vocalized and their calls became louder and louder. I stopped, sensing some great impending Newman, and I could see the group standing in the distance and grabbed Dano and Svetla before they got any further. A shadow was blocking the light that blessed Liuta seconds ago, and there was confusion. Liuta looked up as the large figure, taller than the trees, approached listening to those old ones that she had always heard. The Eidolon I saw was made of mist. The overlapping layers of muscle, bone, and skin all formed out of fog. Despite its transparent body, it still blocked out the bright light of the sun. I had no idea what I was looking at. Everyone stood in awe as the being walked towards the leaders of our group and gestured with its hands. Seven of those at the front were decapitated, their heads and bodies falling to the ground before the mist giant had put his hands back to his sides. Everyone else standing by the fallen scattered. Daniel quivered and fell to his knees. His hands were shaking and he muttered prayers under his breath. Svetla looked at the phantasm with fear and wonder. I pulled them as quietly as I could to hide in the trees. The beings of light welcomed me into their safety. Those of us left have made our home in the woods and the fields of the mountain, deep amongst the evergreens to stay away from the opening where our comrades were slaughtered. We are too scared to try to return home without Liuta. The lights dance around us like fireflies and bring us comfort. There is food and the trees provide ample shelter. Instead of living in the barren land of Ada, we are now people of this mountain forest that has no name. The next author needs no introduction. He's one of the founding fathers of the genre, and if you're here, you're probably already familiar with his works. His stories which can sometimes be problematic, which may be a discussion for a future episode, change the way that we think about horror and literature. I am talking, of course, about H.P. Lovecraft. This is one of my favorites among his works, The Outsider. Unhappy is he to whom the memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Wretched is he who looks back upon lone hours in vast and dismal chambers with brown hangings and maddening rows of antique books, or upon odd watches in twilight groves of grotesque, gigantic, and vine-encumbered trees that silently wave twisted branches far aloft. Such a lot the gods gave to me, to me, the dazed, the disappointed, the barren, the broken. And yet I am strangely content and cling desperately to those seer memories when my mind momentarily threatens to reach beyond to the other. I know not where I was born, save that the castle was infinitely old and infinitely horrible. 
full of dark passages and having high ceilings where the eye could find only cobwebs and shadows. The stones in the crumbling corridors seemed always hideously damp, and there was an accursed smell everywhere, as of the piled up corpses of dead generations. It was never light, so that I used sometimes to light candles and gaze steadily at them for relief. Nor was there any sun outdoors, since the terrible trees grew high above the topmost accessible tower. There was one black tower which reached above the trees into the unknown outer sky, but that was partially ruined and could not be ascended save by a well-nigh impossible climb up the sheer wall, stone by stone. I must have lived years in this place, but I cannot measure the time. Beings must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself, or anything alive but the noiseless rats and bats and spiders. I think that whoever nursed me must have been shockingly aged, since my first conception of a living person was that of something mockingly like myself, yet distorted, shriveled, and decaying like the castle. To me, there was nothing grotesque in the bones and skeletons that strode some of the stone crypts deep down among the foundations. I fantastically associated these things with everyday events and thought them more natural than the colored pictures of living beings which I found in many of the moldy books. From such books, I learned all that I know. No teacher urged or guided me, and I do not recall hearing any human voice in all those years, not even my own. For although I had read of speech, I had never thought to try to speak aloud. My aspect was a matter equally unthought of, for there were no mirrors in the castle, and I merely regarded myself by instinct as akin to the youthful figures I saw drawn and painted in the books. I felt conscious of youth because I remembered so little. Outside, across the putrid moat and under the dark mute trees, I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books, and would longingly picture myself amidst gay crowds in the sunny world beyond the endless forest. Once I tried to escape from the forest, but as I went farther from the castle, the shade grew denser and the air more filled with brooding fear so that I ran frantically back, lest I lose my way in a labyrinth of nighted silence. So through endless twilights I dreamed and waited, though I knew not what I waited for. Then in the shadowy solitude my longing for light grew so frantic that I could rest no more, and I lifted entreating hands to the single black ruined tower that reached above the forest into the unknown outer sky. And at last I resolved to scale that tower, fall though I might, since it were better to glimpse the sky and perish than to live without ever beholding the day. In the dank twilight I climbed the worn and aged stone stairs till I reached to the level where they ceased, and thereafter clung perilously to small footholds leading upward. Ghastly and terrible was that dead, stairless cylinder of rock, black, ruined, and deserted, and sinister with startled bats whose wings made no noise. But more ghastly and terrible still was the slowness of my progress, for climb as I might, the darkness overhead grew no thinner and a new chill as of haunted and venerable mold assailed me. I shivered as I wondered why I did not reach the light, and would have looked down had I dared. I fancied that night had come suddenly upon me, and vainly groped with one free hand for a window embrasure, that I might peer out and above and try to judge the height I had attained. All at once, after an infinity of awesome, sightless crawling up that concave and desperate precipice, I felt my head touch a solid thing, and I knew I must have gained the roof, or at least some kind of floor. In the darkness I raised my free hand and tested the barrier, finding it stone and immovable. Then came a deadly circuit of the tower clinging to whatever holds the slimy wall could give till finally my testing hand found the barrier yielding, 
and I turned upward again, pushing the slab or door with my head as I used both hands in my fearful ascent. There was no light revealed above, and as my hands went higher, I knew that my climb was for the nonce ended, since the slab was the trap door of an aperture, leading to a level stone surface of greater circumference than the lower tower. No doubt the floor of some lofty and capacious observation chamber. I crawled through carefully and tried to prevent the heavy slab from falling back into place, but failed in the latter attempt. As I lay exhausted on the stone floor, I heard the eerie echoes of its fall, but hoped when necessary to pry it open again. Believing I was now at a prodigious height, far above the accursed branches of the wood, I dragged myself up from the floor and fumbled about for windows, that I might look for the first time upon the sky and the moon and the stars of which I had read. But on every hand I was disappointed since all that I found were vast shelves of marble, bearing odious oblong boxes of disturbing size. More and more I reflected and wondered what hoary secrets might abide in this high apartment so many eons cut off from the castle below. Then, unexpectedly, my hands came upon a doorway where hung a portal of stone, rough with strange chiseling. Trying it, I found it locked, but with a supreme burst of strength, I overcame all obstacles and dragged it open inward. As I did so, there came to me the purest ecstasy I have ever known. For shining tranquility through an ornate grating of iron and down a short stone passageway of steps that ascended from the newly found doorway was the radiant full moon which I had never before seen save in dreams and in vague visions I dared not call memories. Fancying now that I had attained the very pinnacle of the castle, I commenced to rush up the few steps beyond the door, but the sudden veiling of the moon by a cloud caused me to stumble, and I felt my way more slowly in the dark. It was still very dark when I reached the grating which I tried carefully and found unlocked, but which I did not open for fear of falling from the amazing height to which I had climbed. Then the moon came out. Most demoniacal of all shocks is that of the abysmally unexpected and grotesquely unbelievable. Nothing I had before undergone could compare in terror with what I now saw, with the bizarre marvels that sight implied. The sight itself was as simple as it was stupefying, for it was merely this. Instead of a dizzying prospect of treetops seen from a lofty eminence, there stretched around me on a level through the grating nothing less than the solid ground, decked and diversified by marble slabs and columns, and overshadowed by an ancient stone church, whose ruined spire gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. Half unconscious, I opened the grating and staggered out upon the white gravel path that stretched away in two directions. My mind, stunned and chaotic as it was, still held the frantic craving for light, and not even the fantastic wonder which had happened could stay my course. I neither knew nor cared whether my experience was insanity, dreaming, or magic, but was determined to gaze on brilliance and gaiety at any cost. I knew not who I was, or what I was, or what my surroundings might be, though as I continued to stumble along I became conscious of a kind of fearsome latent memory that made my progress not wholly fortuitous. I passed under an arch out of that region of slabs and columns, and wandered through the open country, sometimes following the visible road but sometimes leaving it curiously to tread across meadows where only occasional ruins bespoke the ancient presence of a forgotten road. Once I swam across a swift river where crumbling mossy masonry told of a bridge long vanished. Over two hours must have passed before I reached what seemed to be my goal, a venerable ivied castle in a thickly wooded park, maddeningly familiar yet full of perplexing strangeness to me. I saw that the moat was filled in and that some of the well-known towers were demolished whilst new wings existed to confuse the beholder. 
But what I observed with chief interest and delight were the open windows gorgeously ablaze with light and sending forth sound of the gayest revelry. Advancing to one of these, I looked in and saw an oddly dressed company indeed, making merry and speaking brightly to one another. I had never seemingly heard a human speech before and could guess only vaguely what was said. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that brought up incredibly remote recollections. Others were utterly alien. I now stepped through the low window into the brilliantly lighted room, stepping as I did so from my single bright moment of hope to my blackest convulsion of despair and realization. The nightmare was quick to come, for as I entered there occurred immediately one of the most terrifying demonstrations I had ever conceived. Scarcely had I crossed the sill when there descended upon the whole company a sudden and unheralded fear of hideous intensity, distorting every face and evoking the most horrible screams from nearly every throat. Flight was universal and in the clamor and panic several fell in a swoon and were dragged away by their madly fleeing companions. Many covered their eyes with their hands and plunged blindly and awkwardly in their race to escape, overturning furniture and stumbling against the walls before they managed to reach one of the many doors. The cries were shocking, and as I stood in the brilliant apartment alone and dazed, listening to their vanishing echoes, I trembled at the thought of what might be lurking near me unseen. At a casual inspection, the room seemed deserted, but when I moved toward one of the alcoves, I thought I detected a presence there, a hint of motion beyond the golden arched doorway leading to another and somewhat similar room. As I approached the arch, I began to perceive the presence more clearly, and then, with the first and last sound I ever uttered, a ghastly ululation that revolted me almost as poignantly as its noxious cause. I beheld in full, frightful vividness the inconceivable, indescribable, and unmentionable monstrosity which had by its simple appearance changed a merry company to a herd of delirious fugitives. I cannot even hint what it was like, for it was a compound of all that is unclean, uncanny, unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. It was the ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and desolation. The putrid, dripping eidolon of unwholesome revelation. The awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. God knows it was not of this world, or no longer of this world. Yet to my horror I saw in its eaten away and bone-revealing outlines a leering, abhorrent travesty on the human shape and in its moldy, disintegrating apparel, an unspeakable quality that chilled me even more. I was almost paralyzed, but not too much so to make a feeble effort toward flight, a backward stumble which failed to break the spell in which the nameless, voiceless monster held me. My eyes, bewitched by the glassy orbs which stared loathsomely into them, refused to close. Though they were mercifully blurred, and showed the terrible object but indistinctly after the first shock. I tried to raise my hand and shut out the sight, yet so stunned were my nerves that my arm could not fully obey my will. The attempt, however, was enough to disturb my balance, so that I had to stagger forward several steps to avoid falling. As I did so, I became suddenly and agonizingly aware of the nearness of the carry-on thing whose hideous hollow breathing I half fancied I could hear. Nearly mad, I found myself yet able to throw out a hand to ward off the fetid apparition which pressed so close, when in one cataclysmic second of cosmic nightmarishness and hellish accident, my fingers touched the rotting outstretched paw of the monster beneath the golden arch. I did not shriek. But all the fiendish ghouls that ride the night wind shrieked for me as in that same second there crashed down upon my mind a single and fleeting avalanche of soul-annihilating memory. I knew in that second all that had been, 
I remembered beyond the frightful castle in the trees and recognized the altered edifice in which I now stood. I recognized, most terrible of all, the unholy abomination that stood leering before me as I withdrew my sullied fingers from its own. But in the cosmos there is balm as well as bitterness, and that balm is Nepenthe. In the supreme horror of that second, I forgot what had horrified me and the burst of black memory vanished in a chaos of echoing images. In a dream I fled from that haunted and accursed pile and ran swiftly and silently in the moonlight. When I returned to the churchyard place of marble and went down the steps I found the stone trap door immovable. But I was not sorry, for I had hated the antique castle in the trees. Now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls on the night wind, and play by day amongst the catacombs of Nefrin Ka in the sealed and unknown valley of Hadoth by the Nile. I know that light is not for me, save that of the moon over the rock tombs of Neb, nor any gaiety save the unnamed feasts of Nitocris beneath the Great Pyramid. Yet in my new wildness and freedom, I almost welcome the bitterness of alienage. For although Nepenthe has calmed me, I know always that I am an outsider, a stranger in this century and among those who are still men. This I have known ever since I stretched out my fingers to the abomination within that great gilded frame, stretched out my fingers and touched a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. All right, thank you so much for listening. This has been The Dread Familiar. Narration and music by Joel Hackett. Stories by Benjamin Gardner and H.P. Lovecraft. My plan is to do an episode every two weeks. This is the first one, so we'll see how successful that is. But I hope to hear from you. Submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Good night.